over. The first is just to let you know that we are planning to record this program. Um, second, if you could please self muted so that there isn't any background noise during the presentation, that will be helpful. Um, the mute button is in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Um, it's your choice whether you choose to share a video of yourself. If you are to it. Um, Becky Kolak is available to help you troubleshoot problems. Um, you can either send her a personal chat in Zoom or you can call or text her at her cell phone. Her number is in the email that was sent earlier today at about noon. If your internet isn't working well or you're having challenges hearing the audio, there is an option for you to call into the lecture and to listen to it on your phone. The number and the password are in the chat box and they're also in the email that was sent today at noon. Um, so here's a quick overview of the layout for tonight's program. I'll provide a short intro for Karen and then she'll share her presentation. Um, she'll be waiting to address questions until the end of the presentation. If you come up with any questions, please type them in the chat box at any time. Um, because there are a lot of people attending the program, we're asking that you ask your questions in the chat by typing them instead of speaking them out loud. Um, ben will be monitoring the chat questions and he'll share them with Karen um, at after the presentation finishes um, when we get to the question and answer portion of the program. I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. Um, so without further ado, um, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Karen Wilson this evening. Karen is interested in the alewife and its connection um, between freshwater and marine ecosystems. And she's studied alewife ecology in Maine's lakes, rivers, estuaries, and bays. She's a professor at the University of Southern Maine, where she teaches water-focused courses and conducts research with undergraduate and graduate students, as well as stakeholders throughout Maine. Karen grew up in the Bangor area. She has a PhD in aquatic ecology and has been studying alewives since she returned to Maine in 2005. I'll turn it over to Karen. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, well, thank you all for having me here. I am thrilled. Let me just make sure I'm gonna close the video so I'm not watching you guys or myself. There we go. <laughs> um, so I'm really thrilled to be here. I wish we could be doing this in person. So um, maybe sometime in the future, we can all meet down by uh, the, the counting spot um, for Nequasic Lake and uh, do a repeat of this in person. But until then, this is a great way to, to get together and talk a little bit about alewife. Um, so I'm gonna give a very basic uh, uh, talk, and um, you'll see that I've left out a lot of things that would probably be pretty interesting to listen to um, or to, to ask questions about, and please do. So I can't cover everything, and so my hope is that you'll save those questions and stick them in the chat, and we'll talk about them afterwards. That would be fantastic. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start and we shall see, let me, once again, one last thing, let's see if this works, okay. So let me start, uh, and again, write down any questions you may have. Um, one thing about giving a talk on Zoom is it's sort of talking into nothing, <laughs> so I can't see your reactions. So uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, let me see, do I have control? There we go. All right, so first I just wanna thank uh, Kelp for inviting me to give this talk. And specifically, I wanna thank Kelp for stewarding uh, the Nequasset Alewife Run in collaboration with so many other folks. I also wanted to mention Dr. Thea Willis who helped Kelp way back in 2012, 2013, get the uh, counting going and did some calibration along with some students from Bowdoin College uh, looking at video at the same time people were counting to make sure that the counting methods worked well. Um, also want to thank all the volunteers that help monitor alewife numbers. This is a, a really important um, aspect of alewife management. And I'll talk a little bit more today and can answer more questions about. Um, and again, thanks for inviting me to speak today. So I wanted to, to mention that alewife is one of only a number of indigenous diadromous species. So uh, just to be clear, diadromous species are species that are used two habitats. That's the dye part, freshwater and marine, which are represented here um, on this slide as tidal at the bottom of the slide. You should be able to see my pointer. The main stem of rivers, ponds and lakes, and headwaters. Um, and what I wanted to show you is that in 
on the East Coast, in particular in Maine, 300 years ago, we would have had in many rivers of any size, upwards of 12 different species of fishes moving in and out of the river to the ocean or the other way around. And so it actually would have gotten quite busy in the river. So you'll notice I've put the um, months across the top of this slide from April on the left to November on the right. And this is just a sort, sort of a cartoon of when fish come in. So here, for example, are sturgeon using the main stem of rivers. Um, this is the Atlantic sturgeon a little further out. Um, these are smelts coming in in the main stem to, to spawn. Uh, here are eel that move way up into the headwaters, stay there for 30 years and then come back out. <coughs> excuse me. Um, and here's our alewife and blueback heron. Excuse me, I'm just gonna grab a little bit of water. And so here's our alewife and blueback heron coming out and um, Atlantic salmon. I don't know who I'm on here, a lamprey, and so on. And so <coughs> you can see that these rivers are actually very, very busy with all of the digerable fish moving through. And today, eel life are by far the most abundant of the diadromous fishes, or at least the most obvious <coughs> in these rivers. And that's in part because eel wives, um, along with some of these species, use the largest rivers in Maine as well as the smallest streams to move up to their spawning areas. So they're extraordinarily plastic in their behaviors. Um, and this is probably one of the reasons why they have persisted um, so far. I think there's a few more fish, there's a striped bass. Um, and so what I, what I want to impress upon you with this slide is that our rivers in Maine were very busy places for these fishes moving between freshwater and marine habitats. And alewives right now are by far the most abundant of these species. And I'll talk a little bit about why that might be. Now, I'm gonna talk primarily about alewife in this talk, but it's important to know that uh, alewife are often referred to as river herring. And this is because we have another species of river herring called the blueback herring. And if you look at these two fish, you'll probably notice that they're very similar. And in fact, these are two dead fish that look kind of beat up. And the reason why is that we've um, opened up their abdominal cavities to check the lining of the abdominal cavity, which in an alewife is pale white, um, and in the blueback is dark or black. Um, and so that's the only way to get a positive idea. And in fact, it doesn't always work because these fish sometimes. Um, end up interbreeding, um, hybridizing together. But you will hear people talk about river herring, and the reason for that is because on an operational scale, it's really difficult to tell the difference between these two species. If you look closely, you might start to see some differences. Uh, for example, alewives tend to be uh, deeper bodied from here to here, um, whereas bluebacks are sort of longer relative to their, the depth of their body. Alewives tend to have bigger, eyes and sort of stumpier noses, but again, very difficult to tell. So uh, you may hear people referring to river herring. Managers often lump them together um, because for the purposes of counts, uh, you can imagine if the two of, the, of these fish were moving over a fish ladder, it'd be very difficult to distinguish between the two. There are some behavioral differences that I'll mention. The other thing that I want to make very clear is that the native range of alewife is here along the eastern seabird of the United States and up into Atlantic Canada. These fish um, are native, mostly what we call sea run. So those are the fishes that move between the freshwater and marine systems. There are some what are called landlocked populations and there's some um, natural landlocked populations. So alewife has an amazing ability that if they get stuck in a freshwater body, and if it's big enough, if it's a big enough large uh, body of water, like a large lake, they can actually overwinter and even reproduce in that lake, and so they'll become what's called landlocked. Those fish have a very different ecological impact on the lakes in which they live because they're there 365 days a year, whereas our native fishes that are moving in, spawning, and then leaving, 
maybe in the lake anywhere from a month to four or five months at the most. So um, if you are doing some research online, for example, on alewives, what you'll notice is that um, you'll run across a lot of uh, scholarly articles as well as newspaper articles about impacts of alewives, particularly in the Great Lakes. And that's because there are large populations of landlocked alewives in the Great Lakes, and they've had a real big impact on the ecology of those lakes. So you wanna make sure that you're distinguishing between the landlocks versus the sea run alewives, um, because they really do have different impacts. Uh, just to be complete here, you'll see the blueback herring have um, a very similar distribution. They tend to not go quite as far north um, and they, at least historically, have gone further south. So There's slightly more warm water fish. Um, okay, I'll come back, for, come back to that. Blueback herring uh, are um, ecologically a little different from alewives in that uh, although they spawn in fresh water, they tend to prefer slow moving rivers. Um, whereas alewives almost always will target lakes and sometimes slow moving rivers. But both of these species are quite plastic. And so in Maine, there's quite a number of blueback herring runs that spawn in um, a lake right alongside um, alewives. So for example, Nequasset is one, uh, not Nequasset, I'm sorry, um, Winnegans in uh, Phippsburg has both alewives and blueback in a very uh, very small small pond. Uh, blueback do come after or sort of at the tail end of the alewife run. So there are a lot of uh, alewife harvesters who um, can tell when the bluebacks are starting to arrive and they'll often stop harvesting at that time because they tend to be a little bit smaller of a fish. So I want to talk a little bit about the life history and ecology of this fish. Um, and then I'm gonna talk after that about restoration of the alewife. So these are actually a pretty phenomenal fish in that they're very much like a salmon, except unlike Pacific salmon, once they spawn in fresh water, they turn around and go back out to sea. So a typical life history would be something like this. An adult, somewhere in the age of three to five years old usually, um, swims up the river back to the lake in which it was spawned. So these are what we call natal spawning lakes. They return to their natal lake. Um, and so they swim back up river to where they were spawned. Um, and then the female will lay anywhere from 30 to 120,000 eggs in the lake. Um, usually sort of spread out in shallow areas. Um, uh, I Generally, the, the eggs are in individuals and they will sink to the bottom. Um, it might take about two weeks before the eggs hatch. And then the juveniles spend the summer in the lake. So they may stay, leave as early as July, or they may leave as late as October and sometimes near the end of November, depending upon the circumstances. What's really interesting to think about is that each lake in Maine that has an adult or has an alewife run has a different set of circumstances that impact when these young deer head back out to sea. So for example, um, Nequasset has a very short run to at least an estuary. Um, whereas I work at a lake in, just outside of Portland that has a, uh, that often has such low water levels in July, August, and September that the fish simply can't get out. And so they really often won't leave until there are fall rains that put enough water into that uh, stream so they can get over the dam and get out of the lake. So the young of year will leave anywhere from July and through late as October. They move out um, through the estuaries and then out into the nearshore marine habitat where um, they will stick pretty close actually when they're small. I'll show you some, some uh, distribution of young fish just to give you a feel for what it looks like out there. Um, and then eventually, when they're three years old at first, they'll head back up to their natal spawning lake and the cycle starts again. Um, if a fish is particularly lucky and if they aren't harvested while they're out at sea or eaten by many, many predators out at sea, um, they might be able to come back to spawn three, four, maybe even five times. It's rare to find a fish that 
is eight or nine years old, but it does happen, um, particularly in runs where there's no harvesting. So really quite remarkable. Um, this is what a juvenile alewife looks like, caught in the middle of a lake at night. This was caught in Highland Lake at 10 p.m. <laughs> uh, on uh, August 15th. So these are quite small. And in fact, the juveniles that come out of Highland Lake tend to be quite small. Although here's some fish caught in 2011. Uh, this, these were caught in October, uh, early October. And you can see that they've grown quite a bit. Um, and these fish, with the exception of the dead individual at the bottom, are ready to head out uh, to sea. So alewives have been uh, talked about in all sorts of different ways. Um, and one is as a potential nutrient vector, um, either bringing nutrients from the ocean into a lake or taking freshwater nutrients back out to the ocean. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons why people have started thinking about this is that Atlantic, or sorry, Pacific salmon, which come into a lake and then uh, spawn and then die are known to be incredibly important nutrient vectors where they bring the nutrients in that essentially drive the food web that feed their offspring um, so that they have enough offspring to head back out to sea. And so when it became apparent that alewives in some way are similar to sort of ecologically in some way are similar to uh, the Pacific salmon, people started asking questions about, well, how much nutrients are they actually bringing in and is this significant? Um, so I've been doing some work on this in some lakes uh, and uh, I would say that I'm not going to go into details, but I, I think the, the summary is it really depends on the lake. It depends how much nutrients are already in the lake. It depends on how many adults are coming in and relative to how many juveniles are going out. Um, but, uh, but it's very interesting because uh, the nutrients can drive the algae, which are eaten by zooplankton, which are consumed by the juveniles. And then the juveniles themselves, you can think of them as a packet of, in this case, nitrogen and phosphorus, a very important fundamental nutrients. Uh, they're sort of a packet of nitrogen and phosphorus that they've gathered while living in this freshwater lake, and then they leave a mass and head back out to the ocean. You'll notice from the slide that there is some mortality of these adults when they come in. Um, and mortality estimates are all across the, the board. Um, it often will depend on how difficult it is for the fish to get into the lake. Um, is it an easy passage year? Is it difficult passage year? Um, in Highland Lake, one year when we had low water levels, we found that uh, we seemed to see more dead fish in the lake um, versus years when there were high water levels and passage was easy fish were less stressed um, and seemed to do much better in the lake. So it really uh, it can depend literally year to year on what the mortality might be. Alewife also have a very large role to play in food webs. Um, and so here we have just sort of a very simplified food web. And in fact, I, I left out the important part um, that is, they are also eating zooplankton. So they eat zooplankton, large predators eat them. Um, and so if you uh, are a bass fisherman and are fishing bass in a lake with an alewife run, um, invariably, if you were to look in the stomach of that bass, you would find tons of tiny little alewives. Um, and the same seems to be true in the marine habitat as well, or could be true. So, um, so these fish are uh, not only uh, proficient consumers of zooplankton, but they are also tasty little morsels for many predatory fishes. And in fact, it's this role as a prey item that has in part uh, inspired um, this effort at restoration of alewives because right now in the marine environment, um, Atlantic herring are near um, historic lows, um, and so there aren't a lot of prey items for uh, fish like cod to eat in the nearshore marine in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and alewives are one of the few species of marine 
fish or what we call forage fish, fish that are eaten by many other fishes, that we can actually control direct access to their spawning grounds. So it's an opportunity uh, to increase the number of prey items in the marine environment by allowing them into fresh water, um, which is interesting because it sets up some interesting dynamics um, in the sense that there are folks who say fish for cod who'd like to see more prey items, but alewife also will swim 60 to 100 miles inland to a lake to spawn, and people living around that lake really aren't too concerned that there's enough prey for cod to eat in the near shore marine habitat. So there's some really interesting dynamics, sort of social dynamics that are set up um, because of how this fish crosses boundaries, all sorts of boundaries. So I'm sort of rolling into why restoration and stewardship. I'll talk a little bit about this, but I'm gonna talk about some of the restoration that's been done in the state and some of the work that I've done that has uh, been monitoring and assessing what does that restoration mean. Um, and again, I feel like I'm skipping over a million things. So if you, if you have questions, write them down and I look forward to, to talking more. So this is why um, there has been a push to uh, restore alewives. Um, and that is that there has been a precipitous decline range of wide. Um, in the number of fishes that have been caught. Now these are just harvest numbers and they in fact don't even go back. We have some data further back earlier than 1887. And, um, and the numbers here are, are just, so this is just what's harvested, right? So this is millions of pounds. There had to have been uh, millions of pounds getting up into the lakes to spawn in order to produce millions of pounds. Um, and, and what's interesting is that dams were already in place by 1887, not some of the biggest ones, but uh, a lot of dams. But the fish persisted, persisted. And then even in the 1950s, when we had the worst water quality, sort of from industrial issues, from um, paper mills and things like that, you still had pretty high production of alewives until this period of time. And so you see that the harvest goes way up. And that's because this is the offshore intercept fisheries. So these are big pair trawlers um, operating three miles off. Um, and they're taking all sizes of fish, adults and two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and so on. Probably not one-year-olds, but everyone. And that's when you see the fisheries crows. So this is, incidentally, this is um, the entire um, eastern seaboard. And so you see this incredible crash in harvest and then almost nothing. Um, and there's nothing being harvested because there's not much to harvest. Um, and in fact, by the end of this timeline, um, fisheries for alewives are closed in Connecticut, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Virginia, and Rhode Island. Just closed. Um, because there was simply nothing else, nothing to do. So this is really a precipitous decline. And this is the same kind of decline that has been mirrored in many of the diadermous fish species. Um, but with alewives, we have an opportunity to restore them because of their plastic nature. They really take well to restoration. Now, Maine never lost alewives completely, and in fact, we've never stopped harvesting alewives. But I want you to see that what we have in Maine now is simply nothing compared to what we used to have. Um, so this is the historic distribution of alewives, as far as we know from various records. Um, uh, this is from um, sometimes from written data, sometimes from stories, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what you can see is that alewife were swimming way up, um, up into the Penobscot, up into the Kennebec, um, and many, many different lakes in these systems. And of course, we can't even see the small lakes and ponds in this diagram. So compare that map to this distribution. Let me just go back so you can see how little of their historic habitat alewives can now reach. It's really quite dramatic. Um, and so uh, what's interesting though is here's a fish where we have an opportunity to restore them to something close to natural numbers um, in part simply by reintroducing them to their spawning habitat. Now there's a lot of other things that also has to happen. For example, um, they need to be protected in the marine system as well, and I'll talk briefly about that. Okay, so 
Um, just to give you a feel of what's been lost, um, if you take some very conservative numbers based on and look at lake area, uh, so the DMR uses this number 235 adult alewife produced per acre of lake. So that's 235 adult alewife return per a lake acre. And if you use that very conservative number, um, you ought to have something like 14.5 million adults returning to spawn just in the Penobscot watershed alone, um, and something like 54.6 million adults returning to spawn statewide. So here are some numbers. So this is some calculations that were done by the Maine Department of Marine Resources. And again, we think these calculations are quite conservative, but they kind of give you a feel for what you might expect. So 22 million in the St. Croix, 14 million in the Penobscot, 11 million in the Kennebec, and so on. And this is just based on the amount of lake area that we think these fish historically um, were able to access for spawning habitat. And again, sort of the back of an envelope calculation, you might expect something like 24 billion juveniles to be um, produced by that number of adults, by those 54.6 million adults. That's a lot of fish um, to fuel production of commercial species in the near shore marine. Um, we're making some strides towards these numbers, but we've got a long ways to go. Um, incidentally, this is a picture of a, of a um, mackerel that we caught um, off of, I believe, Damariscotta back in 2008, 2009. And you can see we've just um, pumped its stomach. And <laughs> this is what it had in its stomach. So these are very freshly eaten um, juvenile alewives or river herring, since we don't actually know what they are. So um, from a fisheries perspective, this is an awful lot of forage fish in the marine environment that we are no longer producing, primarily because alewives can no longer access much of their historic habitat due to dams. So what's been done in response to these declines? Well, I already mentioned in an earlier slide that four states have closed their fisheries unilaterally um, at different years. And in fact, in 2011, um, there was a petition to the Endangered Species Act for listing of alewives as an endangered species or a threatened species. Um, and so uh, in 2012, all but Maine, New Hampshire, New York closed their fisheries um, until they could demonstrate sustainable harvests. And um, Maine was then required to start collecting data um, on their uh, harvested runs to show that they were uh, sustainable. So the sustainability is based on number of fish escaping into the lake to spawn, the fish that aren't harvested, so it has to be some proportion of the run. Um, you need to have a age distribution so that the fish that you're harvesting are not just three-year-olds because that suggests that you're not getting any repeat spawners. You're not getting fish that are coming back year after year. And that um, when you don't have those repeat spawners, you're missing that um, uh, resilience that's built into having fish from multiple years coming back to spawn. And so um, the Department of Marine Resources requires that alewife harvesters do counts uh, up to a point and um, are keeping track of what we call the age structure, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and so on. Um, in 2013, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries found no cause to list blueback herring or alewife, um, but said that they would review the decision in five years. And then they established a uh, river herring technical working group that I've worked a little bit with um, to move the science forward um, on river herring. And in fact, there's been quite a lot of work that's been done in this time period. And then just recently, and I have to say, I'm not sure if it was 2018 or 2019, um, during the five-year review, they found no cause again to list um, alewife and blueback herring as an endangered species. However, um, lots of good things have, ha have happened in that time. 
I did want to comment that you can't restore a fish if it's still being uh, consumed at a large rate. And so there's been work that's been done between um, this, uh, how do you say? So what the, what scientists did oops, uh, is um, started looking at bycatch. So bycatch is uh, alewives that are incidentally captured in the Atlantic herring fishery because these two species, Atlantic, um, Atlantic herring and alewives and bluebacks often swim together. Um, and so what they did is they sampled these bycatches, uh, bycatch from um, up and down the eastern seaboard here. And uh, they looked at the genetics of the fish. And because these fish are natal spawners, you can at least tell, you can distinguish Maine fish from Massachusetts fish and Connecticut and Rhode Island, from New York and so on down the, down the seaboard. And so what they were finding is that the majority of uh, bycatch tended to happen to fish that were coming out of the Connecticut River and, and, and this region here, both for alewife and then for blueback was a little bit further south. Um, and so this bycatch study actually started a um, voluntary effort for fishers who are working on in the Atlantic herring fishery so that if they were to bring a net on board and capture mostly river herring, they report it and other fishers know not to go into that area. And that actually appears to have reduced the bycatch of, of uh, river herring um, somewhat. Um, this also helps explain why Maine fish were doing pretty well um, and that when Maine fish uh, undergo restoration, you actually get a response. Whereas in this other region of the country, all of this uh, freshwater restoration work was going on and not getting a lot of payback, not a lot of fish coming back. And that's probably because a fair amount of those fish were uh, caught as bycatch. And so there's been some progress in reducing bycatch of river herring. And that's very helpful from the restoration perspective. Okay. So what's interesting about alewives and probably blueback herring, but we don't usually do this with blueback herring, is that you can reestablish a run by releasing these adults that are coming up to spawn. So you can capture them in one river and truck them over to a pond where you want to start a alewife run. They will release their eggs and gametes at that pond. And those juveniles that are born that summer will then, three years later, four years later, come back up to that same pond to spawn. Um, and what's really interesting about this is that uh, it's pretty clear that uh, Native Americans knew about this um, and that settlers knew about this. And there's a lot of early mentions of people doing that. So for example, in Belding 1921, there's a mention of artificially started runs in Cape Cod in the mid 1800s. So we knew that this was going on for a long time and it's extraordinarily uh, helpful. As long as you have good passage and as long as uh, there isn't high levels of bycatch at sea, um, it's fairly easy to um, reestablish these runs. And so there's been very active management through what we call stocking. So stocking is releasing these adults that are ready to spawn. Um, so there's been very active management through stocking of spawning adults since at, since at least the early 1900s, um, especially here in Maine. And I wanted to say many of you are probably very familiar with the Damascata um, fish run. Uh, and we know that that ladder was first um, built in 1805, 1807, very, very early 1800s, and has been uh, managed since then. Um, I don't know if that was a historical run or if it was an introduced, well, introduced, if it was moved over from someplace else, but um, that's a long time to manage these runs. And there are also many runs that are simply maintained by people lifting fish over barriers. Um, this, is a, <laughs> this is a great example from uh, Rhode Island back in 2010. Um, and so there's also little runs that people maintain that way. I had something else to say. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> so uh, a number of years ago, I had a graduate student who looked at the stocking records from the state of Maine. Uh, what you'll see is, so what we've shown here is there's uh, these nodes here 
where you have Lockwood uh, fish lift on the Kennebec River. This is Fort Halifax on the Sebastocook River. Um, this is the Brunswick Fishway on the Androscoggin River. And for many years, uh, since the 1950s and on, the Department of Marine Resources has captured adults who are ready to spawn and then trucked them to uh, reestablish spawning runs or to augment spawning runs. And so this, uh, these are just looking through these old records and you can see where fish were taken uh, from those spots. So technically, these fish here should be pretty closely related to the fish that run up to, well, the Fort Halifax Dam that's no longer there. Um, and so uh, this is one of the ways that the Department of Resources, main, main resources has reestablished runs around the state. Now, I wanted to show that, that uh, just some, some results of these stocking efforts. Um, and so this is for the Kennebec watershed. And so you can see uh, the Kennebec watershed has three points where fish are measured, the Androscoggin River, the Kennebec uh, Lockwood Dam, and the Sebastocook River, which is a tributary to the Kennebec. And um, you'll notice that these runs sort of bopped along in the 1980s, 90s, and then this very sharp yellow line, which is continuing to rise, in fact, um, is the Sepastacook tributary to the Kennebec River. Um, and those uh, numbers result from numerous efforts uh, to have uh, different dams removed. For example, the Edwards Dam removed in 1998-99, uh, or sorry, there it is, 1999. Um, you have fish being lifted over the Fort Halifax Dam starting in 2000. Um, you have fish ladders at the Kennebec Lockwood. And then uh, the Fort Halifax Dam is removed. Um, and fish access to Sebastocook Lake and so on. And so look at the change in the number of adults coming up to spawn just in that period of time. That's quite remarkable. So now up into 3 million fish returning to the Sebastocook watershed. That's quite a remarkable uh, recovery. It is, however, still very little. I think it was 11 million that is a conservative estimate of what you might expect. Um, so quite a ways to go yet. Um, and the same type of work is going on in the Penobscot right now. And so what this graph is showing is on the y-axis is the number of adult alewives. And these bars represent the number of fish that have been, these are again spawning adults that have been stocked into lakes in the Penobscot watershed. So these are the different lakes. Um, and this one is showing 2010 through 2015. Remember that these fish come back or alewives come back at age four. And so here's what um, fish look like. These are a number of dam removals and fish passage works that were done. Um, the Great Works Dam and the Vesey Dam were main stem dams. And here's the response. So by 2015, there was 900,000 fish coming back, um, returning to the watershed from starting about 9,000 um, adult alewives uh, in 2011. So quite a dramatic. Um, there's been a lot going on in Penobscot since 2015. And so here's an updated figure. Um, now there are so many fish coming back that I had to change the scale of my graph. So the y-axis on the left side is showing the number of stocked adults in various ponds over time, the lakes. Um, and then the red line tracks the number of adults coming back to the watershed, um, reaching a high of almost 3 million fish. Um, and 2019 has actually dropped a bit because um, Blackman Stream, I believe, is not included in this number. Um, so one of, the, one of the habitats. So again, a tremendous recovery. Um, however, the Penobscot watershed um, has a long ways to go to reach even a conservative estimate of the number of alewives you could expect to produce um, in a watershed of that size. Um, a caveat too, and this is a, a figure from the St. Croix River on the US-Canada border, um, and that is you can also lose alewives if you take away spawning habitat. So those of you who are up on the um, St. Croix River know that uh, fish passage has been reestablished 
um, on the St. Croix and numbers are going up. Um, but this is what happened from 1980 to 2005. Um, so what you see in the red is the number of spawning alewife in millions returning to the river, um, and it nearly reached um, 3 million uh, in the late 1980s. But then spawning habitat uh, access was dropped down. So this is the spawning habitat available during this time period. It drops down as uh, fishways are closed and so on. Um, in fact, this run only persisted because the Canadians trucked fish over a couple of US dams. <laughs> However, uh, the, you can almost look at this graph in reverse uh, because many of these fish patches have now been reopened and numbers are going back up. Um, so just to give you a feel for what does this all mean and um, a little bit about <clears throat> some ecology and some things that we're learning as these restorations are recurring. So this is a picture of the Penobscot estuary part of a survey that is done by uh, NOAA Fisheries monitoring the response of the estuary to this restoration. Now the restoration is technically for all diatomous fish, but it's alewives that have responded the most. Um, and so uh, these red lines are research trawls. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple. So I was working with NOAA on this, um, looking at some of the fish that they were catching. So this is uh, their trawl cod ends. So this is where all the fish end up. And it's, it's kind of an interesting trawl because it's a live capture. So they call this, uh, I think they call this the coffin, which is odd, but the fish get in and they're not killed um, as they would be in other um, types of trawls. And the reason for this in part is because endangered Atlantic salmon are also caught during the survey. So these are almost entirely river herring that you see here. And um, they tend to account for the large majority of fish biomass that's caught in the estuary. So this is just showing increases in acoustical, um, bioacoustic monitoring. So this, these aren't trawl results, these are just looking at um, basically using a sonar to look at what fish are underwater, showing these increases as we go from 2012 to 2015. So we're really starting to see more and more fish in the estuary. Um, and most of these fish are thought to be river herring. Uh, so I did some work with a graduate student on fish that were caught in the trawl. Um, we were wondering what all those juvenile little alewives were doing in the estuary. Turns out they're eating, um, and they're eating a lot. Um, and so they eat uh, mycids and barnacle larvae and um, and all sorts of copepods and um, and so they were eating a whole lot which was really interesting to see um, and the other thing that we found was that these fish uh, were spending variable amounts of time in the estuary so um, to figure this out we use something called stable isotopes um, and we're looking at carbon here and I'm not going to go into the details of stable isotopes, so I'm happy to explain them afterwards if someone would like to know more. Um, but basically what it allows us to do is to track where did the carbon in the body of these organisms come from? What was the bottom of the food web? Um, and an interesting thing about using stable isotopes is that the values you get for freshwater systems over here on the left are very different than the values you get over in the marine um, system. And so these are alewives captured from the marine system, and these are alewives captured in lakes. And you can see that their carbon values are really different. And that's helpful because it tells us where have they been feeding and how recently. And so um, what we did is we sampled fish in May, so that's, those are these blue dots, um, in the estuary. And what you'll see is that some of them have this very in-between value between marine and freshwater, and some of them have a really marine value, but they're all, um, so these guys were between 85 and 100 millimeters in length. These ones were larger, they were 165. So these are probably one to two year old fish um, that were, had a marine signal, but they were captured in the estuary, which means they had come in from the marine environment to feed in the estuary. And we, um, then the other thing that we did is we also, so this was fish tissue, which takes a, a sort of, has a um, two month or 
month long value of where that fish has been. And then we looked at liver, which gives you within days of where that fish has been feeding. And so this individual, for example, this was its muscle tissue and this was its liver tissue. So this is showing that for the last month or so, it was feeding in the marine environment. The liver is telling us that it had recently moved into the estuary. And these fish have the same thing. They're moving kind of this way. So they were probably more in a freshwater habitat and they're moving towards um, this marine value and so on. And so we found this pattern um, in July. And here we have some young, younger guys, littler fish. And we also found it in September. September is kind of cool because we still have large fish in the upper right hand corner who are coming in from the marine environment. But look at these guys. These guys are freshwater fish that have, remember we caught them in the estuary, but they still have the, the signature, this pattern that they were from freshwater. So they've recently, so this is a fish that has recently come from freshwater, caught in the estuary. So all these fish were caught in the estuary except for the diamonds. Um, here's other fish that were, again, have a very close to freshwater signature, but their liver is really showing this kind of signature of the estuary. And I should say that these little guys up here is a copepod and mice and shrimp that were caught in the estuary. These are their carbon values. Um, and if you eat them long enough, that becomes, if you're a fish, that becomes your value. So what was really interesting about this study is that if you look in the older literature uh, for alewives in this region of the world, they simply um, say that they uh, are hatched in freshwater and then they move out to the ocean. But this is showing that these estuaries, at least an estuary the size of the Penobscot estuary, and this is probably true for the Kennebec estuary, is a really important habitat. And in fact, fish are coming in from the marine habitat to feed in those estuaries. And this is something we didn't know before. I also wanted to show you that these juvenile alewives, and these are actually less than 10 meters, 10 centimeters in size. Um, so these are young of year and one-year-old fishes are uh, found pretty much everywhere in the nearshore marine of the Maine coast. So these are data from the Department of Marine Resources. Here's what's kind of cool. Uh, these are data that I looked at in 2013. And the question was, so are these restoration efforts in the Kennebec and the Penobscot making a difference in the number of juveniles in the nearshore marine? And in 2013, yeah, you couldn't really tell. I recently went back and uh, talked with the DMR folks. We were just on the phone just a couple of days ago. And um, it looks like there is a measurable increase in juvenile ill lives off the coast of Maine that you can, by 2020, or actually 2019, you can see an increase in these fish in the near shore marine um, in the trawl survey data, which means that um, that original objective to increase the amount of forage fish um, looks like it may, in fact, be successful. So stay, stay tuned for that, for those results. So um, alewives have been really interesting to work with because they really provide a strong incentive for restoration and stewardship. Um, unlike almost any other marine forage fish, you can actually see them on their way to spawning. And if you happen to live along the lakeshore, you've probably seen them spawn as they splash around in the shallows. Um, this is really unusual. Uh, for any marine fish. The other thing that's really interesting about these fish is that it's a really dependable reward. The fish that you steward will come back three to four years later to spawn um, in your spawning run. And that's, that's really phenomenal. Uh, and so we find that um, it's, it's a great reward and it's a short enough period of time that people can see the results of their efforts. The other thing that's been really helpful for alewives is that there is monetary value in these fish. Um, they are harvested for lobster bait. Um, and the way that the harvest works is that the harvest, uh, the towns have a license uh, to, that they then um, give out or, or rent out, if you will. Um, and so the towns are required to have a fish committee and so on. Um, this is actually a pretty unusual way to uh, manage a fishery. It's quite unique and been done for a very long time here in Maine. Um, 
These runs provide income for the harvesters, but they also provide income for towns. So there are some towns in Maine that might get thirty or forty thousand dollars, no strings attached money that comes in every year from the alewife harvest. And then there are other towns in Maine that have uh, started airway uh, river herring festivals and uh, brought money in that way. Um, and it's one of the few opportunities, as I said, to have a direct impact on the spawning success of a marine forage fish, which is really quite remarkable. And I'm going to stop there. So uh, ignore that. Uh, yeah, that slide was supposed to be fixed. But this, uh, I want to stop here because this is a picture of uh, harvesters harvesting fish at Benton Falls on Sebastopol River. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons why they're, they're harvesting a tremendous number of fish there, uh, the DMR is passing as many fish as they can at that dam, and they literally can't pass anymore. Um, there are so many fish coming back. Um, and so uh, very quickly, a very lucrative harvest has um, happened. And one thing that you should do is go figure out where Benton is. It's really far inland, and it's amazing that you have uh, this harvest occurring so far inland from a fish that swum all the way up the river to spawn. So I'm going to end there and um, I feel like I need to change the slide here. So I'd, I really uh, would love to take any questions. And I think I will stop sharing. All right, Karen, I might start out with a couple questions that people email. Um, so one that we had was, is it possible to distinguish between male and female ad alewives from external characteristics? That's a great question. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> um, no, uh, the only way you can really distinguish them is to give them a little squeeze and see if you get eggs or sperm. Um, another question that we had was, uh, do you know if there are any physiological changes that take place to allow um, the fish to deal with that transition from saltwater to freshwater when they return to spawn? Right, that's actually a really great question. Um, there are some physiological um, changes that happen, but these fish seem to be able to handle that transition between freshwater and marine much better than say a salmon, for example. Um, and so you'll see them hanging out in estuaries. Uh, for example, we've tracked, um, we put some tags in fish up in the freshwater portion of the Penobscot River one year, um, and they dropped back down into the estuary and then spent the next month swimming around Bucksport, going up into freshwater and back down um, into, uh, into the sort of the, the more salty areas and seem to have no problems. So they're quite remarkable in that. Um, it, that is the, to be able to do that physiologically is, is um, quite remarkable. Let's see, another question we had was, why are they named alewives? <laughs> I saw that question and I forget. Um, it's, not, <laughs> it's not the only name that they're called. Um, they're also known as, um, was it saw bellies because they have sharp saw like um, scales along their their belly um, and they're called Gasparo uh, in Atlantic Canada. Um, another question was how do the number of alewives running or why do they vary so much um, from day to day and during a day? Right so that's a Another great question. Um, one of the things that you would find is if you spent some time at different alewife runs, you'll find that they actually will often um, run at different times depending upon the run. So if there are some runs, for example, where they can only have passage. Passage only works at high tide. Um, I've heard of runs where the fish have to uh, go under a busy bridge and that they tend to wait and run at night when there's not as much traffic. Um, most runs go during the day, but not all. So it, it's uh, so you can be know everything about your run and then go talk to someone else and they'll be like, oh no, they only run at night. And it really just comes down to the particular characteristics of the stream or the river um, 
that 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 the, the fish are moving through. Um, this is kind of related to illwives, but also to other fish. Um, are you seeing, or is there a documented boost in population of other species that regularly feed on alewives? So um, the 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 one million dollar question is whether we're seeing more marine fish eating alewives. Uh, and so the Department of Marine Resources and NOAA Fisheries have been collecting diets of cod and other larger predators that are caught in their survey trawls. And um, it sounds like we're starting to see a change. So for many years, eh, you rarely saw an alewife in a diet, but we seem to be getting to the point where there's enough small alewives that we might actually be seeing an increase in the number of alewives and diets. Because you know, when you're working in the marine environment, it's really a needle in the haystack kind of a situation. So you really have to have a lot of alewives to, to pick them up. And it looks like progress may be made in that area. Uh -huh. We have one question that might uh, also kind of relate to that um, from the chat box. Were there fewer fish this year at Nequasset? And if so, um, is there a reason? Might be a reason for that? I don't know that what the numbers have been at Nequasset. Um, this is a uh, interesting spring because it was cold for a while and now it's been quite dry. Um, and that has impacted some runs if there's passage issues, but I don't know what the results, does anyone at Kelt know? if there are low numbers this year? I know the harvest numbers are quite low this year, um, at least compared to the last couple of years. I don't, I haven't had a chance to run the numbers yet um, for the alewife run. There are still alewives trickling in. There were some folks counting today. Um, we got some relatively high, I think primarily the evening counts um, would get 50 to 100 alewives. Um, and so there were several days where there'd be pulses of alewives coming in. Um, but I haven't run the numbers yet, so I can't um, give you that feedback. I'll be sending out an email when the run is done with uh, details about those numbers, and I'll make sure that everybody who registered for this program um, is on the, our email list for that. And I, and I should add that um, because the vast majority of the ill that come back to spawn are four-year-olds, you can count back four years and see what things looked like that year and that often will influence how many fish you have coming back at a particular, for a particular year. And are there any other questions in the chat to share? Uh, yes, one other question right now is, uh, how do we move from action, fish population grows or collapses to prediction, proposed action, uh, predicted consequences? Are there any predicted consequences? Are there ecological simulations available? Uh, do you mean in terms of what is it? Do you mean in terms of what it means to have increased numbers of alewives? Is that what we're asking? I think so, yeah. That's a good question. Um, there has been some recent modeling efforts. There's two modeling efforts that uh, might answer some of those questions. Um, one is some work out of Humane, um, working on predicting nutrient um, transport of alewives, either upstream or back down out to the ocean. Um, and I'd be happy to provide those references. There's another uh, group working out of UMass Amherst, um, out of Adrian Jordan's lab. Um, where they've been doing some ecosystem modeling of what does it mean to have increases in the number of alewives either in marine environments or in, in freshwater environments. Um, and that's an interesting group to watch, keep an eye on, um, starting to get a little bit more of a predictive idea of what's going on. Um, we have the work that we've been doing in the Penobscot estuary. Uh, I've been working with Rachel Lastly Rasher from USM, who um, has been looking at the zooplankton, changes in zooplankton in the estuary as the number of alewives has increased. And what's been interesting about that is that despite the fact that fish are becoming more abundant, 
we're not seeing a big decrease in zooplankton, at least in an estuary. So it's sort of an open, more of an open system than in a lake. Sometimes in lakes you'll see decreases in zooplankton, but that doesn't appear to be happening in the estuary, at least at the numbers we see today. That's it for the chat box questions so far. Thank you. Those are good, some great questions. Um, if that's it for chat questions, I think we still have a couple more minutes. If anyone was interested in asking a question verbally, um, if that would be easier for you, um, if you can use the um raise your hand feature um we'll unmute you so that you can talk or see if you can i guess we can change it so you can unmute yourselves um All right. You should be able to unmute, unmute yourselves at this point if anybody would like to. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, um, then uh, I guess we'll, we'll end this for tonight, but thank you so much to everyone for attending. Um, this is our first lecture, so uh, we'll, we're still figuring out how we'll post it, um, but we're so glad that you were able to join us. Um, and please, if you have any questions later, feel free to send them along. And thank you so much to Karen for being willing to present. That was really wonderful. Great, well, thank you all. I'd much rather do it in person, but we'll do what we can. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks.